Okay. So are they online though? Yeah. They are. Great. Welcome. And thanks for your interest. And this is supposed to be a, what you missed yesterday, but we're going to do it a little different because I'm actually going to talk about some of the slides. So, and that will be welcomed by some. But I don't want you to hesitate to interrupt with questions because really the information is the best if we all stay on the same page and we understand what I'm talking about. And sometimes I can, I, I get pretty excited about this stuff because it is a passion for me is understanding the brain and the behavior, and particularly when it comes to understanding HD and what we can do to make lives as good as possible and make life as high functioning as possible, as long as possible for people. So if I go off on a little tangent, feel free to uh, cue me or say, you know, let's go back to cognition because I welcome that kind of feedback. What I'd like to start with now is, do I advance the slide? Yeah, if you not put the, uh, yeah. I'll be the That's all right, I can step up here to do it. Oh, then again, I can't because it didn't respond. Did you hit enter? Can I do this? Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so first, the research that I do um, is funded by mostly the National Institute of Health. We have an imaging study and a large study understand earlier signs of HD. And that study in itself came from you, the family the family said to me, all the clinical trials that you're running to treat Huntington's disease are done after a motor diagnosis is given, but I want treatments now, is what people would say, or I want treatments earlier because, you know, my mom had subtle cognitive changes and behavioral changes where she struggled with depression, and I would like treatment earlier so we can slow this disease down and maximize when people are at their highest level. That's where we want to intervene. So that feedback came directly from families to launch the PREDICT HD study, which you may see the booths and stop by and learn about, but it has literally doubled what we know about the length of this disease. We used to think it was at motor diagnosis, and it's about a 15 to 20 year um, disease progression. And now we know that we can document early signs because of you saying, look, we want assistance earlier, about 15 to 20 years earlier. So now we know this disease is uh, probably more like a 30 to 40 year um, disease. And with that help, hopefully we'll be able to move in and help people understand and function and compensate better. So that was all done for you. And that information was used to get more money from the National Institute of Health. And some of those ideas resulted in CHDI coming to us and saying, we think we you have a good idea and we'll pay to expand your study to Europe. So they paid for the expansion to the European countries as well. <clears throat> so what we want to start with is before we can think about what does cognition do in Huntington's disease, we need to think about what do we just know about the brain and behavior. And so that's the first thing to think about. How many people have known someone that had a stroke? How many of those people that you knew had a stroke, there was an obvious behavioral or cognitive change that you could witness? Yeah, almost everyone. What were some of those changes that you witnessed that you noticed in people? Yeah. I this is my grandma, and at first, um, she was very just an um, easy-going person. Like, you know, um, she'd be like, well, where do you want to go to eat? Oh, I don't care. You know, and it just turned into, like, real more specific. Like, everything had to be done in a specific way. And if it wasn't, she'd get upset. Things that upset her, you know, that did upset her before. Oh, so that's very observant, though, because what she needed was much more structure that her brain wasn't able to provide her. And that is something the brain automatically does, but when the brain is impacted by either a stroke or disease, that automatic structuring doesn't necessarily occur. I just love that example because one of the things that HD specifically impacts is there's a normal filtering that goes on in the brain. Like right now, uh, we'll talk about this later, but I'm going to have you do this right now. Right now, if you just sit and observe things, you'll notice that you'll hear a few people moving around. We may hear our blessed little one making a few little coups, our lovely. You may be noting that you really didn't get enough for lunch and your stomach's kind of cueing you or your throat's a little dry. These are all input signals that are coming into the brain. They're all coming in saying, me, me, pay attention to me. Your bladder might be sending a signal saying, whoa, I didn't get a bathroom break. Or that arthritis in that knee is acting up and it's sending a signal, ah, my knee's throbbing, it's hurting. So 
So the brain is getting all these signals. And at the same time, you're trying to sit here and filter out distracting signals and focus into, I really want to learn about cognition in Huntington's disease so I can help myself and help my family. But the brain's natural filtering in people with Huntington's disease or stroke or other brain insults, that natural filtering might not occur. You'll see um, a, a common example is children whose brain isn't uh, operating naturally and they just get overstimulated with too much noise so they do better in quiet environments. Like some of the things that I hear uh, patients or kids talk about is, oh, the fan is too noisy. Or I know, have you ever watched Monk? How many people have watched Monk on TV? And he is great because he shows that perfectly. You know how he just, oh, it's too noisy. It's too, everything is too noisy. You know, he can't handle all the stimulation. Because brains that are a little different, they may not have that automatic filtering. And that is one thing that we see in HD, is that automatic capability to filter things in and out. Because you're not consciously sitting here going, okay, I'm not going to deal with my arthritis. I'm not going to deal with my bladder. I, I, I quiet down. I don't really need that chocolate. You know, I, the baby's not distracting me. The fan isn't distracting me. The, the direct feedback from my microphone isn't distracting me. You don't sit there and go through and tell your brain to do that. Or how many people are doing that? <laughs> Sometimes I do have to automatically say, you don't need the chocolate, you don't need the chocolate, <laughs> or, you know, you already had enough caffeine. But, you know, normally we don't do that. You know why? Because our brain does that for us. It helps us focus our attention where we want it. And if we're tired or something else, then we can't do it as well. But that's what our brain will naturally do. So one thing is to think about how what our brain naturally does and that it is affected by changes in the brain. The second thing is that there are day-to-day -day effects on the, on the brain. Um, how many of you feel like there are days when you're just, you know, you're cooking, you're on, you can think of things quickly, and then there are other days, which for some of us at some point in time, I feel like there are every day where you're just like running through molasses and the word doesn't come out. And, you know, or, or it's the year at convention when I'm constantly going, hi, and inside I'm going, I can't remember your name, but I know I know you. You know, and you just, you just, it isn't there. You're just not there. Um, does anybody else have days like that or is it just me? <laughs> I, I do have days like that in moments and hours. Um, but when that happens, sometimes we go, why is that? And sometimes we, can, we know why. And what are some of the things that can impact, impact just your day-to-day -day brain function? Sleep. I agree. What else? Stress. Yeah, I agree. Stress, sleep, anything else impact? What? Hunger. Hunger. Okay, yeah. Sometimes you do have to stop and get that. Anything else? Weather. Oh, yeah. Actually, the weather can do that, too. Mm -hmm. I agree completely. I can't believe this group didn't say caffeine. Mm -hmm. Because nobody thinks that they operate better after that first cup of coffee in the morning, right, <laughs> than before. But it seems to be something we're all hardwired to do. And it, sometimes it really does start to feel like, oh, okay, I can function now. I've had my... Caffeine, for me, it's the Diet Coke, which you can still, I'm still using this late in the day. So I'm obviously feeling like I'm not quite on. But all those things do have an impact. And what's interesting is it isn't just those obvious things like sleep and hunger. It's also, you know, if you have a fresh cold um, or if, you know, whatever the whole they totally, oops, we had a question earlier. No. Okay. Um, that impacts, so you'll have hormonal changes and other neurotransmitter changes that impact how your brain is functioning. So on those days when you're thinking, what is wrong with me? It's probably the normal fluctuation. It's allergies. Oh, that can impact all those things in the head, too. So that happens with everyone all the time. So now on top of just the fact that, yeah, your, your behavior is directly related to how your brain is functioning, and secondly, that there are a lot of impacts on your brain every day, and we haven't even talked about if you're taking medicine for something. What we're here to think about is the chronic effects on the brain when there is a disease or a stroke or any type of injury. So on top of the fact that all of us may be tired or taking a cold medicine, or uh, didn't get our cup of coffee yet, all those impacts on the brain. In addition, we have a chronic thing. But in this case, the good news is it is a slow progression, typically. HD, I know we in the HD families don't think, oh, it's not slow enough. You know, I've seen my loved one 
uh, lose abilities or you feel like I have lost abilities that are too fast and it's painful. But relative to other diseases that are acquired in the brain, it is slower than most. So that's the good news is we, can, we need to slow that even more. Because if we could just slow this disease down, we could keep people functioning at those high levels for longer, then we may have the best bet of tackling our brain disease, better than the brain diseases that are moving so rapidly, like Lou Gehrig's is, is very rapid. Uh, Alzheimer's is only 10 years. I mean, they're, they're, they're not as slow as our disease. So we want to figure out how we can maximize the best cognitive functioning for the longest. And that's what we're really trying to do. So in addition to all those normal fluctuations, you have a disease. And that's what we want to think about today, that of course we're all going to have these fluctuations, but on top we have a disease that's slow, that is changing the way the brain works. Now, the good news after that is that the brain is amazing at compensating. Now, this wasn't something I put in my talk, you know, 20 years ago, because we didn't think that was so. And the research has shown it to be so, that the brain is amazing at compensating. That's why there's so much research now in stem cells, because it turns out that if you do use something like a stem cell, which is a cell that isn't differentiated, doesn't know if it's supposed to be an elbow or a kidney, it maybe can be a, a brain cell. But that's why there's research in that, because maybe once we figure out how to slow this disease or take care of this disease, we could go in and use the stem cells to regenerate. Because what we've learned about the brain is it's remarkable at trying to take care of itself. There are some uh, babies, uh, unfortunately, that have a stroke in, at birth. It's stressful, they have a weakness, and they have a bleed in the brain. So it's a stroke. Most strokes you hear in older people, right? Well, there are a lot of babies. And when a baby has a stroke, it takes out a lot of their brain because they're little bitty brains. And literally, it can take out a whole hemisphere or like two-thirds of the brain. So people used to think, oh, you know, that's bad news. Now we follow these kids, not we, but I mean the seal, not me, the seal, have followed these kids up through adolescence, adulthood, and you can't tell that they've got a stroke. It's amazing, and, when, and I've seen these kids because the researcher uh, videotapes, got permission to videotape, because literally, teachers in school, parents, you can't separate them from their peers. And this is, that. I mean, if you had that stroke in late life, it, it would be much more difficult. But our brain is amazing, and so this kind of research is making us so hopeful for what we can do with brains. And I think that's the other piece, is I, we start to see it once we learn that, that, oh, you mean that isn't your only chance at a brain cell, right? It's going to regenerate. It's going to compensate. Once we learn that, we start looking at other things. And sure enough, even in the HD field, in our pre-diagnosed sample, which we call the prodrome, the prodrome is before the disease is diagnosed, in that prodrome sample that now we have imaging on and measures on, it turns out that even when their behavior is perfectly normal, they can still do the task, although they say it's harder. I have to work harder to do my same level of work. I'm still good at it, but I'm tired. That's uh, something I hear a lot. When we looked at their performance, it was still normal, the same as it was before, but the brain was different. Instead of using just this area of the brain, they were using a whole bunch of other areas. It's like the brain knew to recruit other areas. Hey, come and help me. I'm tired. Come and help me. You know, and so this brain was lighting up and showing us that there was more glucose utilization, more oxygen utilization in parts of the brain that didn't even do that task before. So what we learn is that the brain is working hard to compensate for your difficulties. And what we're going to do is try to learn what HD does so we also can compensate for the difficulties. And these kinds of findings can help us help each other at how to maintain the highest level of functioning as long as possible. And hopefully, they'll also train us how to reach uh, treatment that may help us with this. Any questions so far? Are we on the same page? Great. OK. OK, so this is just my little cartoon picture of learning some of the basics of a brain. Um, uh, other people that know someone who had a stroke, did you have any specific behavior uh, that was have impacted or knew someone that you could show, tell. Yeah? My dad worked with numbers his whole life, and after the stroke, he couldn't dial a phone number. His brother dial a phone, do you remember those? Yeah. He couldn't do numbers anymore. But it was specifically numbers. Yeah, just numbers. Yeah. 
and he had always done that before. Yeah. That. And, really, so and was the rest of his behavior good? I know perfect. A little bit of selective memory. Yeah. Okay. Kind of. So her example is that um, when her father had a stroke, it was numbers. You know, it was difficult. And some selective memory that was specific. So it turns out that the brain, many complex abilities, you know, needs a lot of the brain to do. But there are parts of the brain that are very specific for very specific things. And so this is the kind of thing that um, people that get into this stuff, we like to map out where all these different abilities are. So this is my little cartoon of some of the mapping out that has been done. You know, uh, I have these eyes. Now this brain is facing this way. This part right here is the temporal lobe, which comes right here at your temples. And so it's facing this way, and the face would be, you know, down here. Um, so this would be in the back of the head. And in, in the back of the head, which is the occipital lobe, there's cells that are specific to all different types of visual processing. And the visual processing, which is why I have these little eyeballs back here, but the visual processing is amazing because there's a different cell that's for color, a different cell for movement. So some people, you know, can see it only if it moves, you know, or they can only see certain colors. You probably know people that are so-called colorblind, right? So the visual processing is all dissected into all of these very specific parts of the brain and what visual processing is done. So that's one example of a part of the brain that's very sensitive to that behavior. Now this, I have these two guys talking because the temporal lobes are sensitive to memory and learning, but also to what I call auditory conversations. So when two people talk amongst each other, we process that in our auditory cortex. So those are some different things that happen in the temporal lobe. It would be that kind of uh, uh, interaction and learning what you're doing. Then I have this globe up here because the parietal lobe runs across the back of your head here. And one thing that we know is sensitive to the parietal lobe is spatial and perceptual processing. So I often tell the story, uh, it, I don't like to tell a story, but I do often tell a story of my own strengths and weaknesses. Because we all have strengths and weaknesses. We're born, some of us are amazing verbal processors. You know the type that can think they're verbal processors. And people, some people are amazing perceptually. They can either draw things or see things you know, with an amazing capacity. And I've always been a, a little bit aware that my perceptual processing wasn't quite up to par, but it became more pronounced as I got older and older because even though I passed driver's ed and all that stuff, I am the person that everyone honks their horn at and yells at because I work so hard backwards, forwards, back with turn the thing, back a little more, turn forward. It takes me forever, and I get out, and I'm still like four yards from the curb. <laughs> And I swear, it felt like I was right on it. In fact, sometimes I even feel the curve, and I still get out and I'm four yards from the curve. So I don't know what that is, but it must be a rock there. That, <laughs> but it's just not my thing. So I always think that when I donate my brain to science at the end of the day, they're going to say, it's amazing she could function with no pride alone. <laughs> 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 this is not my area. It's the whole processing of spatial perceptions and where things are. But we're all born with strengths and weaknesses. Sometimes we're good at this and we're good at this. And you know, as you think through people in your in your lives and in your families, who's good at something and good at something. And that's who we are. And then I have this guy over here in the front. And the frontal lobe is the biggest part of the brain here. And it is the part that separates us from animals. When I go to the high schools to teach uh, the budding scientists about brains, we take all these different brains. We take a mouse brain and a reptile brain and a you know bunny brain and a well, couldn't, shouldn't call it that though. And I have a dog brain and a human brain to show them that the biggest difference is our big, huge frontal lobes. Because some of those animals don't even have this bump in the front, that big, whole big part. And so it really is the part that gives us that, what people call the highest cortical function. You know, and so what I tried to draw up there is he's supposed to be like the CEO or the boss man. Although it's too good a woman I know. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's supposed to be the CEO or the boss man of the brain. So all these other parts of the brain might say, oh, I see someone. Send up a message to the boss to say hello. Oh, remember, we're supposed to set up a meeting with that person. So the memory sends up a request. We have to do this <laughs> if the person's walking. Remember to walk away from the wall, whatever. <laughs> so there's all these messages that go into the boss. And the boss has to prioritize them and make plans and decide what's going to happen first, what's going to happen second, how am I going to organize it. Can't all come crashing in at once. And that boss man has all these high-level things he's got to do. He's got to give feedback to the parts that are doing well. 
got to give feedback to the parts that aren't doing well. You've got to prioritize it, organize it, regulate it. He's got to decide, you know, which parts need to be slowed down, which parts need to speed up. That's the boss man's job, and that's our frontal lobe too. So these are some parts of the brain and what they do. But if we just talked about this, we I could go on forever because I love talking about this stuff, and you might start to nod. So you have to say, time to move on. So what we want to do is now apply this knowledge that you just gained, that you know about the behavior a little bit, and how it relates to the brain, and how people that are brain scientists map out different parts of the brain and what it does. Now we want to say, so what does that have to do with Huntington's disease? And that's what we want to understand. So this slide just shows um, Woody Guthrie, and it shows different pictures of um, uh, pathology slices and brain imaging slices. And I want to focus on the part that is most noticeably different in Huntington's disease. Now, it turns out that a lot of the brain is affected by this disease. So people used to just call it a basal ganglia disorder or a caudate disorder because it's really pronounced in that area. So I'm going to show you what that area is, and then let's think about what that area does. So this would be a slice of the brain this way. So I'd be looking this way, and you're looking at this part that hangs here would be the temporal lobe that hangs down on the side, and then it's basically in the middle, right? So you're looking at this half of my brain. So here's the part that goes over the top of my head, side of my head, temporal lobe, and then this part going up the middle. And in the middle, you see this ventricle. That just means it's an open place that carries fluid. So the dark black is that it's just carrying fluid. That's not tissue. Right next to that area is an area called the caudate, this. And people say it's almond-shaped. In the last talk I gave, someone called it a kidney bean, I think. If anybody was there, correct me. I think they called it a kidney bean. And then as HD affected, it became a string bean. So I thought that was a very interesting description that I hadn't heard. Because I have always heard of it as an almond-shaped structure. And this is very obvious that HD impacts this. Now, this is someone that's a gene negative. But you can see, even in stage two of the disease, this shrinks away. So this area that's pretty fat here already has changed quite a bit. And it continues to shrink to where it disappears. So that part of the brain is what we need to understand better. In addition to all of this, if you look at the slide, you can see that other areas also get more fluid in them. You see, it's not just that area. That area is really important because you can see that's pretty pronounced next to all the other areas. So what a lot of things have done is we've focused a lot of research and energy on understanding that component of the brain. And here's another picture of the same thing. This just has a whole brain with a cutaway of these important structures that are impacted by HD. The blue one is the caudate that I just showed you. Um, the red one is the putamen, which is another part of the basal ganglia, which is very impacted. The thalamus is this green one, which people don't think of as as impacted, but our data is showing that it is. And then what we can see is the cortical gray matter and white matter that runs throughout the brain. And what we've learned about these very important structures are that they serve as almost like a gateway to all these other sections. So what we find that caudate is for is a gate. So when people need something too, like I said, the visual have, might have to go to the boss and say, oh, you recognize her. She, you know, you met her in San Diego, HDSA, and you got to ask how her kids are, and she has two kids. That information is going to relay through the caudate and then go up to the boss in the frontal lobe. So the boss in the frontal lobe can say, oh, say hi, and, you know, whatever, tell me to pleasantly greet that person because I should know them. Well, if it's trying to go up to the caudate, and the caudate, those neurons are diseased, it's going to be take it longer. And what we found is sometimes the brain figures out other ways to do things. So what we do see is uh, everything, a lot of things, go through the caudate, and they're impacted by this disease. So it isn't as simple as, you know, our disease hit the number part. There's a very specific part of the brain that's just for output, and there's a very specific part that's just for input. There's a very specific part, wouldn't it be better if it just hit the cell for color? You know, what would you do? HD would just take away the color vision. I'm sorry, that would be sad, but not is what we have to deal with. Instead, we've got this gateway. And the other way I think about it is a freeway, you know, those big clover leaves where you got to get where you're going and all these uh, highways come into one. And then, oh, I always get on the wrong one, of course. That's not my forte. And then if you get on the wrong line, you have to go out miles and miles to figure out how to get back on the other one. 
to get back to this map where you get up to the road you want. So that's the CAUDE ends up being this amazing relay gate system that if the neurons aren't firing well, you know, you can end up on the wrong freeway. And you might not get the information communicated. So that's a big piece of what the CAUDE is doing. And the way I have these colors is to show you the ones that are impacted by HD the most. So the biggest signal is in the putamen, which is where motor functions are known. And the second one is the CAUDE, which is cognitive. Okay, so these two are by far, and these are our imaging data, and it shows that the change, and these are not diagnosed, these are healthy individuals who are not diagnosed motorically, they still have, this is a huge, what we say, effect size, it means there's a big change in these, even in a healthy brain like this, look how close this brain is. If you look at those, it, the, the ventricles are really narrow, the, the caudate looks perfectly plump, there's still a change. And it's a 2 to 4, 2.2 with 2.4 in the near to diagnosis. And then this is midway and far from diagnosis. So there's still changes occurring, but they're pretty far away. So this is what we're thinking about. OK, this is where we need to focus our treatment. This is where we need to understand what's going on. Then we have white matter. That's also pretty strong, 1.45. Then thalamus and cortical gray matter is actually much weaker. The cortex, which is the primary thing in Alzheimer's disease, isn't really that affected. So the good news is we still have our memories, your personality, your political opinions, and some spouses tell me this is a bad thing that their spouse didn't lose their political opinions. But that's all there. That's not going away. What the access to it is slowed because of that relay station. Yeah. Did you say that the first column is like the day before you become diagnosed and then the near is when you get diagnosed and you don't see the change until later? Is that Yep, let me go in for time. Diagnosis occurs after these groups. Everyone that got diagnosed, we took them out of the study. We're only looking at people that are not diagnosed yet. These are people that are probably the closest to diagnosis, but none of these are diagnosed. So we, and, and this is because of research volunteers that are willing to come in and be in a study so we can learn this. We didn't know this, literally, well, let's see. 11, and we published this in six, so literally more than five years ago, we didn't even know this. Because of the family saying, look, you need to look earlier, we looked earlier and we found, oh, you're right. There's a lot going on a lot earlier. So let's figure it out and let's then try to treat as early as possible. So thanks to the stuff that you shared, we learned that all of this is happening before you even get a diagnosis. So I know that's sad for some people to think, oh, I don't really want to find out the disease is twice as long. But on the other hand, for treatment, it's better if we can do it as soon as possible. And for helping you cope and compensate and make up for any weaknesses, we want to do that as soon as possible, too. So there's a flip side to everything. OK, so how do these, uh, how does, why does the caudate matter? You know, really, it's this little almond-sized structure in this big frame. Why does it matter? So the way that these circuits work, you're saying, how does something go from the occipital lobe up to the boss man and then out to the motor strip? It has the motor strip so you can say, hi, how are you? It has to make your mouth form. It's very complicated. So the way it communicates is you have these little neurons. You know, you can't see them. They're each little bitty, bitty things. But they have to fire to make these little circuits. So think of it as a road or a circuit. And this is supposed to be the little neurons that this is the circuit for I recognized you in the hallway, right? So this is, oh, I recognize her. This, I recognize her. This. Then that's the communication to the boss man. And then if the neurons aren't healthy, the caudate's not processing, it might take longer because this neuron isn't healthy and can't reach. So this guy's got to find another way to get the information. Everything is a little slower. Now, this isn't just true in HD. It's true in any brain impact. But it's just slower. It takes longer. Because we found that the brain is amazing. Look at the imaging I talked about earlier. The other parts of the brain were lighting up, whereas in normal, just this little almond shape would light up when it's relaying the information. So in people whose little almond shape isn't healthy, the rest of the brain lights up saying, how can we help? How can we help? And you get the communication. But it takes longer. So I think the, the biggest thing we know is that everything takes a little longer. So these are just other examples of how to think about this network in the brain. The reason it's not simple like, oh, it's the language area, boom, it's the numbers area, boom, uh, 
and you get the circuit, so it's much more difficult. So you have to think about these circuits and how they move in the brain and how it's impacted. Is this making sense? Yeah? Okay. Stop me if it's not, because I think this is the main thing to understand. Another way to think about circuits is sometimes you need to get feedback. Um, uh, you know, some people actually, I think this is adolescence, but some people think it's Huntington's disease. When you don't have good awareness of perhaps your own hygiene, <laughs> you know, your adolescent, you tell them how many times? No, you really you should probably wash your hair or shower periodically, you know. Who am I to say? I'm just the mother of the child who's reeking with adolescent male BL. But, you know, um, but I don't know what's wrong with the adolescent. But in HD, you have about a third of them who have this feedback loop that doesn't work. So they, they don't mean to not be able to get the information back, but they really might not get it back. They may smell that, but it doesn't get back to the boss man to say, you know, you need to shower today. So sometimes we need to structure things for them, because their brain normally, I mean, most of us, I have a slide later, which actually happened where I looked in the mirror, <laughs> it was too late because I already left home, but I was at work and I looked at my, down at my shoes and they were two different. They were the same shoes, so it wasn't that bad, but it's pretty bad. One was navy and one was black. So the whole time I'm giving my talk, I'm like, oh, God, I, I would have been standing like this. I hope they don't know if my shoes are you know. But, and it wasn't that the feedback loop, but I probably was just too fat, so I didn't get the feedback. You know, you look at yourself in the morning before you go out, and if you got a big, you know, oogie hanging out here, you take care of it, right? Well, what if you see the movie, but your brain doesn't go to the part that says, hey, take care of that, isn't he? You know, don't go out in public that way. So it's not really that person's fault if their brain can't give them the feedback. Does that make sense? Would you like a different description other than this? <laughs> Would you want to call it way too <laughs> graphic? Anyway, so I think it's like a thermostat where the heater doesn't know when to turn on and off unless you manually do it if you don't have a thermostat, or it reads the temperature and tells <coughs> it when to turn on. That's what has to happen in the brain. So this slide just shows us what we've learned from looking at very early HD. So what we titled this talk is trying to understand those earliest cognitive changes. Now that doesn't mean they go away in later stages, but it means that in these earliest things, everything kind of progresses. So you may have some things that aren't really affected till later. But this slide just shows you kind of that progression. Let's just take any one of these. This one is smell identification. And this is how many years to diagnosis. And diagnosis doesn't occur in any of these people. These are about 1,000 people who have not been diagnosed. So this is five years till diagnosis, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 years to diagnosis. That's that expected years to onset or diagnosis. And over here we have a whole bunch of different tests. And it just shows how people perform. And you know, just in normal life, we kind of may get slower on some things. Like I always think, if this were the 50-yard dash, you know, of course we'd be a little slower over time, and then at some point it may drop. Well, this is when really HD is kicking in, and we see these huge drops in almost every ability. Some of them are a little more gradual. So this is um, uh, smell. This one is planning, so it's a task that we give people and um, advance information and we see if they can use it. We're going to give you a hint on what's going to happen next. Like we're going to say, this is going to light up. Hit the light up button as fast as you can. And oh, by the way, it's this one. That's what we do. And then we see how fast they can hit that one. So people that don't use the advanced information, they're just as fast as the test where we say, OK, hit the button that lights up and we don't give them a hint. And they just hit the button that lights up. Then we do a test We say, hit the button that lights up and oh, by the way, and then we see if they can use it. And that's a measure of planning. Can you use information to plan? So that's what this test is. And you can see it kind of gently goes down. And then still, about 12 to 15 years out, they all get more rapid. Now, this is before diagnosis. So this is what we're trying to understand. How can we best understand what's happening? And how can we help people? Because we know the brain is going to try to help things. And we know we can help things. I mean, don't we all? compensate for our weaknesses. I may be the only one, but I compensate for my parking disability. I drive around until there's an easy space I can just drive right in. I don't, I don't waste my time trying to get in between car A and car B because I know that it's very difficult for me, very stressful for me, and I maybe can't even do it because four yards from the curb is quite far. So compensation for me is just drive around until you find an easier space. 
So, you know, you might you don't have to share them. But how many of you think you do some things in life already, kind of compensating for things that aren't your favorite or aren't your forte? Yeah, I think a lot of us are willing to admit that we do that. So what we do in HD is, because this may be new for you, this may be something that just changed. You've gone 20 years being good at this thing, and now, hmm, now you need to start making lists. So it's harder. Because most things, we do it throughout life when we realize, you know what, I'm not good facially. So I'm not going to be a designer or do feng shui or whatever, right? Because facially isn't my thing. But if that starts when you're 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, you've got to learn how to compensate. So that's one thing that we can do. We can help people look. The brain's going to help you, get your environment to help you, do things to help you. I mean, I use half of the techniques all the time anyway because I get too much on my plate and so I don't get things done. So if I don't write them down, I honestly don't remember. And thank goodness, so far anyway, I don't think it's Alzheimer's disease, but if I don't write it down, I won't do it later. I mean, I can tell you. You know, I won't. I don't really, it's not, I don't think so far that it's Alzheimer's, but that's just what we do. So if you don't have a loved one, or if you're someone with HD, and you might be before diagnosis, but on these plants, we can do things for a lot of you. So what can you do? That's what we want to think about. You know, maybe you've never had to take lists before, Never had to jot things down. But what are some of the things we do to help ourselves? Yeah. I'm curious. What do these look like in the, non, in the natural aging process? Yeah. Perfect. Usually, uh, and that's what we're mapping right now. We don't have quite enough, but that's why we have gene negative in the study. Because that's always the question. Repeat it doesn't question. ever do this. Yeah. Repeat the question. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I was better at that yesterday. <laughs> Um, the question was, what happens in normal aging? Because as I said, normally, you know, just as we get older, we, we do some things better, but you know, you don't do everything the way you used to do them. So a normal aging curve is almost everything goes gently down, but the gently down is more like some of these, that's almost flat, maybe like this one. This is probably the best example of normal aging out here where it's just gently, gently sloping down. And what we need to identify right now is exactly what that is. So we're taking the volunteers we have for the gene negatives, and we're doing the same thing with the MRI scans. This one is actually striatal volume, which is the caudate and the putamen. How plump is that part of the brain? And even that goes gently down. But we need to know how different is this gently down from normal. This looks a little steep, doesn't it? So we'd want to check to see if the normal, first of all, it's probably up here a little bit. And then what's the what's the slant look like? That's what we're doing right now. And I don't have those curves. It's an excellent question. But the reason we have to do that is because instead of, particularly for kids, you know, we can't test a child if they have just a cognitive difficulty or a behavioral difficulty, and yet they need to be diagnosed because they're getting labeled with all these things, and they're suffering because we can't tell them if they have HD. So if we could just map this out with normals and say, look, we can quantify what your brain scan looks like, and now we know when to diagnose and draw the blood. Because you don't want to just be drawing the blood all the time and, and, and giving kids information they're not ready for. And the same with all of us, right? We don't want to jump to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't want to jump to that conclusion all the time. And I'm sure a lot of people at risk do. You know, they tell me. Uh, Oh, every time I trip, or every time I can't think of the word for something, I think it's early HD. And, you know, the reason I'm a good person to hang around with is because I do all this stuff all the time. <laughs> and I'm not at risk. So, you know, I can tell you that it's normal to do almost all of these things. You do forget things. You trip. You drop your soda. You know, actually, maybe I'm not normal. But <laughs> the point is, you know, we don't want to always have to worry. You know, you want to have an answer of when you need to think about this. And in the meantime, we all compensate. Why not make the list if the lists are going to help us? Why not do the strategies that we've learned? So the point is, let's figure out what are the changes that occur, what can we do to compensate for those changes. So I think what I mean to show on this slide is we have learned a lot about the changes that occur, and we're using that information to help people learn where they're at and hopefully keep the highest level of functioning possible. And we do have a lot of things that we coach people to do. Um, the easiest one that I do is, you know how we're, in this society, we're so used to doing more than one thing at a time. How many people 
do something while they're driving. You don't want to admit it, right? Yeah. But it depends what you do, because even playing the radio while you're driving is taking brain resources. I know, you don't think so, but it does. And think about, we play the radio, we talk to other people in the car, some of us, um, we have our cell phone ringing, and the cars even help us with this, because they can say, call home, or call Bob, and the phone is calling people for us. So, so you have all this going on in your car, let alone now we have the DVD player, you know, and the iPad and the uh, um, iPods that everybody can have their music blaring. You know, and some people read books on the steering wheel. Have you seen this? Yeah, this is not me. I would be, actually, none of this should be me. Let's face it, that isn't my forte. But this is what we need to pay attention to because some people, some of you are amazing. You can like, put your makeup on while you're talking to the kids and, you know, and I constantly, I'm like, ah. But some people are good at this. That divided attention, that um, doing two things at once, dual processing. But any time you have an insult to the brain, even if it's I'm tired and I haven't had my coffee, or I was in jet lag, or I'm stressed out because I got deadlines at work, that's the first thing you can change. And it's a quick fix, and it dedicates your brain to what's most important. And it's one of the first things I tell people, you know what? It's simple, but just tell the kids we're not having the radio on. They can put their iPods in their ears. It makes a huge difference. Just having the radio on for someone at risk that might be experiencing early, early subtle changes that no one will notice, it helps focus your brain. And that's true in the house. People can use their speakers. You know, you can close the door to where the TV is. You can not pick up the phone. Thank goodness there's uh, answering machines. You can do these things. And it's okay to do them all because that's what's going to keep people functioning as high. Anybody have any other ideas? Any? Because people come up with the most brilliant ideas of what they do. Like in the last session, someone said, you know, they write stuff on their hands. And I said, that doesn't work for me because my lips are huge. But the point was raised to me that, yeah, you can't put your whole list on your hand, just that next thing. And then when you take care of that, when you put the next thing, I thought, oh, that's how they do that. Because I never could use my hands if I make And sometimes just to feel like I'm doing something, I copy my list over so that it looks like I did a new list but really nothing changed because I didn't get anything done. But there are these cues that we can share with one another to help keep our processing as good as possible. <laughs> okay, any questions before I dive into this one? Okay, are we following? Is this helpful? Okay, is there any specific cognitive ability or function you need to discuss that we're not going to fit in? If I keep going? Okay, well, I'm going to ask you that several times because I want to make sure that we address and what's my time like? Uh, you have a question. Oh, yeah. Well, I only got 10. So you got to speak up if you want something addressed. And I'm happy to because, you know, I can talk about this forever as a problem. Okay. So this is the latest hot off the press list of the first things that were impaired. And most of these were put in the battery because of you. The first one is the, this number just tells you, and they're listed in order. This is in our pre-diagnosed group again, so they're not diagnosed, because we know once you get diagnosed, we know we, those are in the literature, and I can show you that as well. Once you're diagnosed, what abilities go. And the main message I have from once you're diagnosed is even in the late stage, we've done research, and I did almost the whole research in uh, people that were either in end stage or late stage, where we went to nursing homes for, I don't think, I don't remember how many were in the study, but we went to a lot of nursing homes just to collect the data. And even in late stage, they still have that personal opinion and memory um, that wasn't gone. So it's so different than Alzheimer's, where one of the first things is they can't learn new information, and then it gets bigger and bigger what their gaps are. Um, in HD, it's harder to learn, so everybody thinks there's a learning problem because it takes a lot more, uh, because the frontal lobe's organized stuff, and now they're not getting the information, so it does take longer. But once it's in there, you don't lose those memories. So that personality and that person, even when they can't talk, because some evaluation we did with a yes no, you know, just give us a, you know, tap here, tap here, a point. And the people that were too impaired and couldn't do that, we do blinks or grunts. 
and we were still able to measure and know that they still were able to understand and participate. So one of my pet peeves that I pass along is don't talk in front of the person like they're not there. Because just like all of us, we don't pay attention all the time, and it might not seem like they're attending, but they can. They can understand and remember and know what's being said, and always take, in my biased view, always take the initiative that that integrity of that individual is still there, and they can hear you. And so I always try to remind, and remind doctors and nurses and all of us that, because it's easy to just be quick and say, oh, you know, whatever we want about the patient, but they're still assuming, in, in this case, in this disease, they still can appreciate that. So I'm open to your input and feedback on that. So we've gone from that late stage study, and we're trying to back it up to get what are the earliest changes. And these are the things that came out. The top one on this table is time. And this is not something that was a traditional thing we measure. It came from a family that said, oh, my husband used to be so punctual, always on time. And you know, not always early, not an anxiety driven, but just really good at, at, at time management, at doing things on, uh, and, and being responsible. And that has slowly gone away. And this was before any motor finally showed up. I asked around, and other people said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. And, you know, to be honest, we never measured it before. But we measured it because you guys said measure it, and sure enough, it is the strongest finding we have right now. The top and earliest finding is what we call time production. But there's two findings that come out in time. One is estimation. You know when people say, I'll be there in five minutes, and really they're there in 45 minutes? You know, or not. So that just estimation is also impaired. So time perception and estimation become impaired. And you, you're thinking to yourself, oh, I know people that are like that all the time. So now think about the brain. There are strengths and weaknesses. And there are some people that always say five minutes, and they're always 10, right? But that's just that person. But in HD, it could be that this is something that's very difficult to judge, time estimation, time perception. The other thing is time production. We have a very simple task where we give them a metronome, and they have to with the metronome, and then if you stop the metronome, what do they do? Well, we measure it in milliseconds, because you can never notice. This looks like I'm kind of on the same knee, maybe they all should way off. But if we measure this in milliseconds on the computer, I'm probably way off, because it's measuring whether I'm keeping on that metronome, how much off. And so this is the people that you probably can't even tell if your timing's off yet. But it turns out it's off early, and probably in a way that you don't notice. Because how many times do you hear someone complain that their time production is off? I, I don't hear it very often. But it turns out it's a good measure. And the reason that's good is you don't have to do much to compensate because how often does that impair you unless you're maybe a drummer? I don't know. We probably need to study you if you're a drummer. But it's good because then we can have a measure that we can put in, measure how your time production is, and then do the intervention, give you some new treatment. Now they have a bunch of new treatments that we're ready to test, and then we can have you do it again and see if it improves. So this is a good measure. So some of your ideas have really um, come into really good measures. So that's the first one. The second one is just timing, which we did know. It's speed and tapping. We have people tap. How fast can they tap? Everything takes longer. And that's not true just in HD. That's in every brain disease, impairment, head injury, things take longer. And we think that's because, of course, it has to do all these back routes. It has to find the circuit that's still working. It's compensating. It's trying to get the task done. So that is sensitive to any disease is that things just take a little longer. So the main thing there is to do what? What can you do if things are going to take you longer? And it's hard for some personalities more than others. I, I'm working on my patients, but I keep saying that every year. <laughs> working on my patients. So I think it's something that's worth telling ourselves over and over that, you know, we just have to be patient. Because the fact that we can still do things if we're patient enough is, is really important. So I've ranked all these, and we don't have to go through all of them, because I really want to leave questions, time for questions. But the other one I do want to talk about is emotional recognition, because it does tend to impact people. Again, it came from concerns brought up by uh, families who are having difficulty communicating. And this impacts people in two ways. The one I have on the board that we measure the easiest is emotional recognition, meaning the person that's at risk for HD doesn't recognize when you're upset or disgusted with them. Now, how many of your spouses always recognize what mood you're in? 
yeah, no, that doesn't happen for me either. But you try, don't you? You do the on the silent treatment or you do the furrowed brow or you might do the whatever. We all have our little signals and some of the eye roll is when we use. So and and over time you kinda oh good that. You know, so you learn them. But HD takes that ability to read that. It's very complex information if you think about it. Because sometimes we let people know just across the room with my kids, and I can give them a certain look, and they call it the hairy eyeball, or you're glaring at me again. I'm just looking at you. No, Mom, that's your glare. Okay. But they're right, because I was kind of trying to give them feedback that that doesn't fly here. It's inappropriate. You know? Sometimes they just pretend like they don't see me. But they know, well, HD has more difficulty identifying what's the facial expression. And research is being done with tone. You know how you can use tone to emphasize and you really mean it? Like when you say, take the garbage out, honey. You know, it's a little different tone. So that, yeah, I'm sure you guys never have to do that. But those are the things that become difficult, those subtle intonations. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. I'm going to go the other way because my husband now, if I speak to him, he accuses me of yelling at him. I'm like, I'm not yelling at you. I may be speaking in a tone of voice. I'm not yelling at you. I don't know. It's like you just read my intention. Exactly. That's exactly this way. There is another way, but this way is that. That they can't read it. And uh, unfortunately, a very common statement I hear is she's always yelling at me or he's always yelling at me or they're, you know, I'm yelled at all day. When really, it is that, you know, <laughs> Kind of make sense of an environment that their brain isn't giving them the best feedback for. So this happens a lot, and I hear it a lot. And I think the reason I wanted to bring it up before we ran out of time is it does impact so many things. It's a simple communication thing, but it impacts us. And it does go the other way, which is that you can't tell what they're feeling because some things that the um, basal ganglia or the cauda and cutamen do is they give what people call a masked facing. And you see some most in Parkinson's disease where it's almost like they wear a mask, and they aren't as expressive as they used to be. How many people have seen this in Huntington's where they're not as expressive? Yeah, and it's difficult because you can't tell them when they're sad or angry because their face is less expressive. So it does go both ways. The one we research the most is them understanding you, but I think, and we have a little data showing that also they can't express the way they're feeling, and it's difficult. So I think both ways it is impaired. So it's a challenge, but it's something we can work on. That's, that's doable. Yeah? Question. You use numbers to rank arteries. What is it quantity to represent? These are effect sizes. So it doesn't matter for this, but when we calculate for a clinical trial how many people you need, which we're all about clinical trials right now, uh, and the reason I bring it up at every talk is because we need volunteers so that when we argue a pharmaceutical company to come to us because we need them to help us run a new treatment, you know, it's hard to compete because we aren't Alzheimer's disease, we aren't Parkinson's disease, we're rare, we're smaller. But if we can fill our clinical trials rapidly and be efficient, that's better than anybody. Nobody fills their clinical trials. So we need more volunteers than we've ever needed before. Because right now, we have treatments and we can't get them to the people. So that's why all my stuff is in effect sizes, because then I take that and say, if I use time production, I need 300 people. If I use, let's go half, letter fluency, I need 600 people. That's what Other questions? Yeah? If I'm to be negative and my friend is being positive, does it tell you if I volunteer to be positive? Her question was, she, if she's being negative, does it help to volunteer? We do have research because we need, as I shared with you, his question was about how do you know what all of us do normally. We have to have some gene negatives to figure out what people do normally. But in the clinical trials where we give a drug or some other treatment, which might involve surgery or something, we're not going to do that in negatives. We're only going to do that in positive. But right now we need negatives to volunteer to see how much you change on time production, for example. No one knows that. You know, how does timing change over your lifetime? We don't know, so we need enough negatives to volunteer so we can map it out. How much does your caudate change in normals without the gene? How much does your time production change in normals without the gene? So we need people to volunteer so we can get those answers so that when we put a drug in a person with the gene, we know when they're getting better because it's different than the 
on gene negative. So that we do need you for that. And the other thing we need is a third of people with Huntington's disease aren't able to report how they're doing. How many people have known someone with poor insight or poor awareness? So a few of you. Uh, it is not, typically not their fault. Almost every person I've seen, actually, I would say um, I would say almost every, because I haven't seen a person that it's not what I mean part of the disease. They're not doing it to be a stick in the mud. They're they really aren't getting the feedback. It's what I described earlier. So families come to me and say, "Oh, well, he's being stubborn. He won't admit it. We've told him ten times he's got HD and he won't admit it." I think the brain isn't helping them. It's very confusing to be told you have movement. <laughs> this great story where the guy was watching his anniversary tape, his 50th wedding anniversary tape or something. Maybe it was 25. Do you remember? I don't know. And he says, look at that guy. That guy has HD. My dad had HD. He was pointing to himself. The room got quiet. It was the after party of his anniversary party, and it was him that he was pointing to. But he had no awareness that he moved, and he moved all over. And those ignosia. I'm sure I remember that one. Yeah. Just call it awareness or insight. But because of that, we need the, the family members to volunteer to help us with the measures. Because if the person is sobbing all the time, isn't interested in activities, isn't sleeping well, they're probably depressed. But if they say I'm fine, we can't tell if the treatment's working. And we need to know which antidepressant is the best. Because right now, we're prescribing, you know, just guessing. I don't know, try on this one. Because there's so many antidepressant treatments. There's so many anti-anxiety treatments. There's now a lot of um, movement treatments. There's treatments for all these symptoms. We don't know the best one. So we need clinical trials so we can say to people, look, 80% of people did that on this kind of antidepressant. Try that one first. Because you know how hard it is when you're depressed and you have to go through trial after trial after trial? It takes weeks to even get an effect. So these are the studies we need. So we do need families to say, look, he, he's crying less, or he, he's doing more, his apathy is less, or he's not sitting around as much, or he's showing that he's talking more, whatever. We need those reports. So that's the other way we need negatives. But mostly we need people to help get their person who has HD to the site so that we can learn. And don't think that research is more important than your day-to-day -day life. You have to put yourself first. Don't volunteer if you just need help getting through the day. That's got to come first. Put yourself first and tell us what you need because we have to take care of you first before we can do the research that's going to educate us about the future. Other questions? Yes. My dad's family has HD, and as I look at the three people in my family that I've seen have it, none of them can hold a job. Have you found that the reason? I don't know if that's just their family or if that's... No, that is definitely part of it. The parts of the brain that are impacted are what I call regulation, right? And you, I typically talk a lot about anger management because it's the thing that brings people to our door. But it's regulation. Regulation is the ability to start something, the ability to shift to something else, and the ability to stop something. Well, if you can't regulate, and our brain naturally does this. So think about it if you had to work on this as hard as you work on a math problem. Because it's very effortful and it's very tiring. So people can't initiate things. It's hard to keep your job because I've had people that they're awesome. They're awesome. They can do their work great. But literally, we had the, the guy said, you know, he does his job great. He works at a uh, car, I don't know, what would a car mechanic place be called, whatever, he was that kind of guy. And and he was great, he was smart, brilliant, could figure out anything, I don't even know what a carburetor looks like, right? But this guy was brilliant, he knew this stuff. What they had to do is they had he, he, rotation of the tires, they'd have to go back out and say, you did a great job putting this one up, look, there's one right over here, do <coughs> this one next. So the initiation, the ability to go to the next thing, it seems natural, doesn't it, for most of us? Well, it's not. That they can they can be brilliant and be able to do something, but if that starter switch, it's like the starter switch on the car. If you can't get the car started, it's hard. So sometimes, you know, we build job recommendations where they can have somebody that works alongside them, but has to keep doing the starter switch. So you have to work with employers, and I worked with some amazing employers that are willing to do this to help people. And not everybody has that problem, but it, it's pretty common, very much pretty common. Some people can't stop even when it's time to stop. You've seen the same person that asks for juice, you know, 52 times an hour when they, we pretty much give them juice all the time, but that's just what they do. Now that's later stage, that is an early.
early when you're working, but you've seen it, that off switch. So those switches are very important to HD, and it's a very typical thing, and definitely you can find people that are willing to work with you. Because <coughs> you want to help people work as long as they can. More questions? Yeah. There's a non-pharmaceutical way of treating some of these things that we strongly well, you know, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? How do we slow the onset? And what the, the data that we know from other diseases and from animals is that that enriched activity idea, that it, it goes way back to, you know, treat your body like a vessel, take care of it, because any time it's impacted with something, it's harder for the body to fight. And it's very true with HD. For example, we know that if you've had a head injury, it makes uh, the disease worse. And that's been documented in many brain diseases that, you know, your Alzheimer's is worse if you've had a car accident or a brain injury. And a lot of people say, well, you know, it was fine until you had that accident at work. Sometimes things, the brain just is working so hard to combat this disease naturally. And the body does. When you get sick, that's what the immune system does, right? It fights. It creates uh, blood cells to help fight it. That's what our body does. And our brain seems to do the same thing. But we have to help, you know. Sometimes that Midwest work ethic kicks in and you just make yourself go to work no matter how sick you are. And that can backfire. I, I think we do have to take care of ourselves, and that's the big message for stress management. Stress sends off huge hormone and uh, changes in the whole system. So this is time, when you're at risk for something, that's the time you have to listen and, and make some TLC. Give yourself some tender loving care and take time out. Don't expect as much. Take more time out of your day. Make sure you're healthy. Don't push it when you're sick. Don't push through. I know it's a hard message because we really like to raise our kids to you push yourself, you do your best all the time. But we do know in the animal studies, the ones that were able to keep active and be healthy did better. And it's true in other diseases. So I know it sounds kind of like, oh, that story again, but it's the main thing so far. And they are doing extra studies on smoking and cholesterol lowering drugs and nutrition because people believe this very strongly that those things that are somewhat simple have maybe been the main treatment for heart disease for years. It's likely that they're also going to help us. So the research isn't done yet, but it's just going on now. Does that help? Yeah. And then these strategies, you know, we stick them in our book, what to do, take more time, be patient, get, make lists, compensate, do every cheat sheet you can. That's what you want to do. You don't need to challenge, you know, the person that, whose brain is working so hard. Make it as easy as possible. Be kind to yourself. Other questions? Anything from the people online? No, I don't see any questions. Okay. Um, thank you for your patience today. I feel like I talked too much.